this is my Settlers of Catan board that I made a couple of years ago. And uh, I mean, you can build the whole board and build all the pieces and buy a replacement pack of cards and have your own Catan board. It's really great. Uh, it's not terribly difficult. But what is much more entertaining is the Electroshock Therapy expansion for Settlers of Catan that I just finished a couple weeks ago. And uh, that's quite a riot. It is a tile that fits into the middle of the board. It actually replaces the desert on my board. And it delivers high voltage shocks to anyone that takes a turn that's too long. And that is a surprisingly effective way of getting people to take short turns and to play very efficiently in Settlers of Catan. I built this Catan board a couple of years ago and it was my first laser cutter project to use wood. I spent a really long time in Illustrator sketching all the pieces and figuring out that I knew exactly what I wanted all of them to look like before I got all the pieces cut. But once you have all the designs, I mean, cutting stuff out on the laser is really easy. I actually had two, or, uh, 327 individual pieces of wood that were cut on the laser that got glued together into 253 different playing pieces, and all of those had to be painted. So all of the pieces of the board are actually intended to fit together. So there's slots on the board where the roads fit in. Uh, the buildings have little circles on them that fit into the building sites at all of the vertices of the hexes and all the ports and all the numbers everything is completely configurable and it all fits together all of these pieces also fit into a custom box it's really just a plain cardboard box but I filled it with floor tile foam and hot glued it all together and the foam I cut out with an exacto knife so that there are slots where all of the individual game pieces fit so there's a slot for the robber there's a slot where you put all the cards there's a slot for the dice all the pieces that all the players get and I even separated like the hexes that are for the base game and the hexes that are for the five to six player expansion and everything is all nicely organized and it really came out well. I'm very happy with how the box turned out. I painted all the pieces with a kind of cartoony style, first drawing all the color and then painting on thin outlines in black. I also used that technique for the electroshock tile which was supposed to look like a circuit board but painted in the same cartoony style. Now, the primary concern for the pieces in a Catan board is, of course, matching the five main colors. I mean, Catan could very easily be played with nothing but solid color tiles, and it would all make sense. That's, like, the game. Uh, but I just tried to match the main color for each. So there's sort of a dark green for the wood, the light green for the sheep, the yellowish tan for the wheat, the light gray for the ore, and sort of a sienna brown for the brick. This is the electroshock tile that goes in the middle of the board and replaces the desert tile. And you can see it's got a whole bunch of wires hanging off of it. And those wires go to these electrodes, which are basically just pieces of HDPE off of a milk carton with wires hot glued to them. And these are the electrodes that you've got to stick to your arm so that it can zap you when you take a turn that's too long. The circuit generates an electromotive force in excess of 1100 volts. Now, probably well in excess, probably over 12, but I haven't measured that high directly. So, the open the EMF is like the open circuit voltage of the power supply. So, that voltage is not actually delivered to a person. The voltage that you would feel across your arm is a lot less because the output impedance of this power supply is exceedingly high. It's like on the order of two and a half mega ohms or something. And beyond that, I actually add extra resistance in series as a safety precaution, even after the hilarious built-in resistance of the power supply. So I've taken some steps to make sure that no one can get hurt by this circuit, but I'm not going to go into any detail about how the high voltage power supply actually works because I don't want people to try this at home. I am going to go into some of the detail of the control theory of the circuit and how it does the timing and the code because I think that's really interesting, but just make it put on a buzzer or something. Don't zap people with it. Um, I mean, if you put on a buzzer when this would electrocute you and the buzzer means that people have to discard cards, that's probably going to be more of an impetus to speed up the game than the electrocution, and it's going to be a lot safer. The main switch on this board used to be a double pull six throw rotary switch, and but it didn't turn all the way around and I wanted it to be able to point at each player as it goes all the way around the board. So I actually bent up the tab that stops it from moving all the way around and I removed one of the brushes. 
and turned it into a single pole 12 throw switch. And uh, now it can point anywhere all the way around the board. And there are actually 12 different positions and six players. So all of the times when someone's taking a turn, it's pointing at that player. And all of the intermittent times, it's actually on pause. So if you only go one forward, it pauses. Or if you want to go to the next player, you click it twice. Every other position on this switch that are all the pause positions that are in between players are actually all shorted together and wired to the same pull-up resistor. So when the game is paused, when the switch is placed at one of the six intervals that are in between the six players, it's connected to the output of the power supply. When the, power supp when the system is paused, of course, that's going to be zero. So that's what drags it down. Otherwise the microcontroller is receiving a, a high signal on its sensor pin because all of those pause settings are linked to the same pull-up resistor on the sensor pin and the system can tell whether it is paused or whether it's pointed at a player. The other interesting thing is that the microcontroller sees all players as the same player. It's like it's actually only playing with one person. It has no way of telling which pause position it's in as the switch goes around the dial and it also has no way of knowing which player it's pointed at. It could be in six different places and all of those could be considered pointing at a player but it doesn't know which is which. It just knows I'm pointed at a player or I'm pointed between players and the system should be paused. Now the reason that the shock is directed at one person is that that high voltage passes through this rotary switch so the microcontroller might not know who it's connected to at the time, but the switch is certainly pointed at the right person and only that one person will get shocked. The microcontroller I used was an Adafruit Trinket. It's very small, but I really only needed two of the pins and uh, three with the ominous blinking LED. So I really liked the tiny form factor aesthetically, but I did cheat and used a, uh, a knockoff Arduino Nano to do all the debugging because it allowed for really easy serial print commands. <laughs> I'm completely spoiled. I'm used to MATLAB where you can literally freeze the program, change variables, and then restart the program from the chain from the point where you paused it and everything will keep running. So it's like amazing debug tools and I put probably two hours into trying to debug on the trinket doing float math and only getting outputs in LED blinks and then gave up on that pretty quick. A turn as the program sees it is any period where the switch is pointed at a player for more than five seconds. That's the minimum turn length. So if you've got, if you're playing with four people, you can go and you just skip someone's turn, but you were only pointed at that player for like a tenth of a second. So it's not going to count that. And you're not going to get a tenth of a second turn averaged in, which is the really important thing because then all of the turns would be really short and the statistics would be messed up and everybody would get shocked. Every time the system enters pause mode, even if it's just pause mode in the click pause click to the next player, it's, that's enough time for it to measure the length of the last turn and add that to an array. I think that I can only store the first hundred turns based on the amount of memory I have on this chip, but that's enough for the vast majority of Catan games. And after that, although I don't think I've tested this, after a hundred turns it should just stop calculating new things and it should have a fixed amount of time before you get zapped. But you calculate using the whole array of turns, the mean turn and the standard deviation in turn length, and use those to come up with the amount of time that it's going to take for the next person to get shocked. Presuming they're going to get shocked on this turn, what would that time be? So every time that a new turn starts, there is a time defined that is the length of that turn before the shock happens. I have a z-score defined in the system as the critical z-score in the code somewhere and that's the the standard um, statistics like if you assume that everything's a normal distribution and I don't think Catan turns are a normal distribution but I'm gonna probably figure that out eventually because now I'm curious. Uh, I take the mean and I add the standard deviation multiplied by my critical z-score and I think that the critical z-score right now is 1.1 so I basically take the mean and plus one standard deviation 
and that is the amount of time where if you take a turn that's that long you're going to get shocked and then you will get shocked at a regular interval after that until you end your turn. Using statistics to run the zap timer is really important because it makes the game adaptable. If you just set like a minute and a half timer and said every player minute and a half maximum turn then you're going to get zapped and keep getting zapped periodically after that. That means that if you're playing with people that know the game really well, that maybe take 45 second turns or one minute turns, then no one's ever going to get zapped and it's not going to be fun. So if you're playing, and, and if you're playing on the opposite end of the spectrum with people that are new and everybody takes slow turns, then maybe everybody's going to get zapped and that's not fun either. You only want the zaps to occur on the players that are taking egregiously long turns. And by running live stats during the game, you can figure out who those players are or at least what that threshold is, because of course it can't actually tell which players are which. And it makes the game more interesting, and it means that every game is going to have roughly the same number of zaps. I mean, that's assuming that Catan turn distributions are a normal distribution, which I don't think they are, but still, it helps. So that is my custom Settlers of Catan board with the uh, recently added Electroshock Therapy expansion. So, if you like this project, be sure to subscribe for more. God, my turn was over! I was reaching for it, too. Ass. Ass. Oh! Typically was that. Oh. Ow. Ow! 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 Jesus. That's four shocks this turn. Busy winning. <laughs> yeah. Oh!